I'm Hikari Sugasaki, and I'm a senior currently, um, and my major is philosophy, Asian studies, and studio art. My name's Paul Sullivan. Uh, I'm also a senior, an Asian studies major with a China studies concentration. Beyond the Barbed Wire is a documentary that um, Hikari and I and um, Ka Wong in the Asian Studies Department have been working on for almost two years now. Um, and it's a, it's a documentary and sort of an accompanying website sort of aimed at um, like sort of talking about the experiences of the Japanese American community that sprang up in Minnesota following the Second World War. Um, and it's, it's talking about their experiences before the war, going into the camps, and then also talking about coming out of it and sort of its implications for today. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a lot of... It, it started off as a Curie project where we weren't really sure what the final outcome was going to be. It started as a trailer, and then um, our professor, um, Kawang, got us together and said, hey, do you want this to be a documentary? Do you want to keep working on it after that summer was over? Um, and we were both kind of like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. During the first showing, uh, my heart was beating pretty fast. It was like, the, 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 oh, no. Or we like, oh, yes, well, it's happening. So, um, yeah, I mean, the initial feelings were just that. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was like, oh, yeah, that could be fixed. I definitely saw that as I watched the film. And watching it over and over again, sometimes it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that part. need to tweak it a little bit more. But other than that, it was just pure excitement to see how other people actually reacted to it. I can kind of echo that. I mean, to have something that you've been working on for two years now, like with people finally be on, you know, the screen that you go to see movies on the weekend for, um, like in Viking Theater, like to have it on that huge screen was just really exciting and a little stressful um, when like trying to figure out some of the quirks in the system. Um, yeah, stressful maybe an understatement, but <laughs> yeah, no, it was, but when it came together and people, you know, we were, we, I mean, we had advertised pretty heavily for mm -hmm. it with posters and online and on the screens around campus, um, but I don't know if we were really sure how many people would show up mm -hmm. in, until the, we, you know, until it was time for people to be there and the room was full. It was, I mean, I think, I don't know what the occupancy of like the sitting occupancy of that place was, but you know, people were in, I think every seat. Yeah, like, yeah. So, and we were just overwhelmed by how many people showed up. People seemed to really in, enjoy the film, and I think that was echoed in our second showing, um, which was which was, it was amazing that there were enough people that wanted to see it that we had to go show it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And we also had a screening over in Monmouth College uh, in Illinois. So it was through the History Club at Monmouth College that we were showing the work. And yeah, a good number of people turned up and there was a lot of very good questions asked towards the end. So yeah, it was just, it's always very interesting to see who shows up. I think that this project is particularly relevant because it's a really good medium for us to be able to display and show these people's experiences. Um, like Hikari said, unfortunately and potentially for one of the last times, um, in a way that can be really well, well preserved and sort of be able to showcase their experiences in an sort of ineffably human way for years to come from now. Um, I think that's something that has always sort of captivated me about documentary making and film is that it allows someone to, you know, see someone speak, see their body language, listen to their voice, and relay these stories from their life experiences that really don't come across on paper, I feel like. I think that was one of the, I think that's like one of the reasons I'm most grateful that we ended up making a documentary about it, um, especially in light of, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately these stories are becoming more and more relevant again um, with the Japanese American internment coming up in the news as people have talked about Islamophobia in the States right now. Um, and again, unfortunately, you know, but also showing that this is really relevant. You know, when we asked almost all of our interviewees, you know, why is it important that people learn about this today? So, so many of them um, related it back to the, the growth in Islamophobia since 9-11. Um, 
and what they went through, you know, during the war, before the war, um, and the sort of prejudice that is has been growing, and that it has that really concerned them. And I think for a community that has sometimes not been has sometimes not been as vocal relatively compared to other communities in the past. I think that's significant that they've all sort of latched onto that and said, hey, this is this is a very parallel situation that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. A lot of our research at first was about trying to connect the dots of this really scattered puzzle that was the Japanese American community in Minnesota. So trying to figure out, is this person still around? Where did they live? Um, you know, what's their story? Trying to find out what happened to them, you know, for the students that came to St. Olaf. You know, what were their lives like here? And doing some of that research was really, it was really like a thrill for me, I guess. If I can add an anecdote to that. Please, please. Because uh, I guess some of the detective work that we ended up doing, at one point we were trying to figure out, okay, what were their family, like how many members of their family were in the internment camps, who was in their family, um, as well as can we contact their family members, that sort, uh, that sort of thing. Paul found this um, website, I think it was in, through some government organization where it like listed all the individual members of each family as well as where they were placed within the internment camp. So that was kind of just like, wow, we found this. As well as uh, just um, unexpected findings because one of the, so one of our first interviewees uh, gave us a list of other people that uh, this person was very well connected within the Japanese American community in the cities. So they were able to pro- provide us with a list of other people that they thought would be interested in talking with us. And so they, we called or emailed some the people that um, they, uh, in the list that they gave us. And one of them, Paul called, and this person was actually uh, the sister of um, one of the students that came, one of the Japanese American s- students that came to St. Olaf, right, uh, like during the internment experience. And so we were like, whoa, we were not expecting that. We, we did not know that when we called her. Um, yeah. That was sort of a, she, she mentioned like St. Olaf or something. Yeah. And she was yeah, like, yeah. oh, yeah, my sister went there. And we were like, wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. unfortunately, we weren't able to interview her her sister herself, because the sister was in Seattle. So for this, I guess, project uh, going forward, we're not quite done yet. (laughs) Um, We're doing little things. uh, I mean, there's a few more edits I think we could make. um, And in watching the film being screened multiple times, um, there's definitely some bits and pieces that need to be fixed. Because we were also thinking about doing uh, closed captioning for the entire film in Japanese because that uh, was something that a Japanese professor at, here at St. Olaf also said that it would be great for um, people currently growing up in the U.S. of Japanese ancestry for them to know about what is happening because this is crucial to their history as well um, growing up here in the U.S. So um, translating that into Japanese as well as for people in Japan also who are not exactly familiar with what had happened to Japanese Americans in the U.S. during World War II. I think this is also something very relevant. So the next step, at least for me, for this project specifically, would be to translate and make sure that it all has closed captioning so that people who only speak Japanese and are not as um, fluent in English can also uh, look at our documentary, watch it, and understand it. I think I can, I suppose, like, I guess one thing I can add to, like, as far as where the documentary is going in the future, um, one of the steps that we're hoping to sort of add, um, some of the some of the music in the documentary is is our original pieces recorded by Jimmy Coughlin, another St. Olaf student, um, and we're hoping to add um, to that and have another student record even even more pieces so that more of the more of the film has original music instead of royalty free music um which i'm i'm a huge fan of because i think that's a big sort of step towards making it you know you can almost say like a real documentary <laughs> um which i mean it is but like yeah that and i think i suppose we haven't really talked about it but it would be i've like i've sort of been like thinking about like how we can how we can disperse this or 
distribute the film once it reaches its final form, um, whether that's DVD or streaming or I don't know yet. Um, but yeah, those are those are sort of the things that I, I sort of see the film doing in the future, along with the hopefully if the film festivals and with um, Hikari subtitling stuff. Kiri, at least as as we experienced it, was. I mean, for me, I think I can say without reserve that it was like the best summer job I ever had. Um, partly because summer jobs for me in the past, coming from Iowa, have generally meant working on a farm. So <laughs> that's you know that was that was definitely a leg up, you know, being in an air conditioned office. But also, <laughs> but also being able to work on something like that, self directed, um, for eight hours a day and doing that all summer, was really cool.